government of perversion. And because we have sat under the government of perversion, we have fed that perversion until it has expanded to the point that we are under an extended period of bondage. Not as a consequence of how perverse the enemy is, but as a consequence of how much we've been feeding the perverse enemy. When, when we meet the devil in the garden, he's a serpent. By the time he gets to Revelation, he's a dragon. Somebody's been feeding that joker. Focus on this thing. He's a serpent when we meet him in Eden. He's a dragon by the time we get to Revelations. You strengthen what you feed. If there's strong perversion in your life, it's not because you were dealt a bad hand. It's because you are feeding something until you've strengthened it to the point that now you are under the government of something you should never be under the government of. The Bible said there's a man named Ahab in the Bible. Ahab was more wicked than all the kings who were before them, which makes a grand statement if you consider the kings that were before him. The Bible said Ahab considered sin trivial. The Bible actually says he considered it trivial to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So that he took for a wife Jezebel. Who looks at Jezebel and thinks that chick would make an awesome wife? But the trivialization of his own sin caused him to develop perverse affections and he's tra attracted to something he should be disgusted by. It's quieter in here tonight than it ought to be, but I'm going to keep going. Listen. What made Ahab attracted to Jezebel? Jezebel didn't put a spell on him. He had a perversion that had generated unrighteous affections, and now he's attracted to something he should be disgusted by. Let me tell you a story. I'm staying, I'm in, I'm in Detroit, Michigan one time, preaching at a conference. I'm going to be very vulnerable when I tell this story. I'm in Detroit, Michigan. I'm preaching at a conference. I'm staying at the Hilton, and Sting is doing a concert at the palace. Sting gets on the elevator at my hotel. Y'all don't know Sting. I ain't talking about the wrestler. God, I'm in Tennessee. I feel I'm in Tennessee. Sting, the singer, is on the elevator, and there's a, 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 just a handful of not ugly women with him. Apparently, the rock star thing was getting, what, getting him what he wanted. I ain't trying to blow Sting out, but I'm, you know, whatever. So I'm on the elevator, and I'm, this woman looks at me, and, 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 and she's reasonably attractive. And that's the biggest understatement I've made in the entire revival. And I'm going, oh God, 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 oh God. I mean, no, she's like looking at me. And I'm going, mm. and all of a sudden, God said, look at her. I said, God, I ain't looking at her. Huh? Let my eye be single so that my whole body will be full of life. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. God, I am like both of my eyes. I'm not interested in plucking any of them out because I'm finna look at this chick. And I looked at her because God told me to. And all of a sudden, her face transformed into a demonic figure. And I saw it looked like her skin melted off of her face. Her teeth turned green and her eyes looked like flaming fire. He said, this is what perversion will do. Perversion will cause you to be attracted to something that you should be disgusted by, therefore missing what you should be attracted to if you had righteously generated affections. See, that's why some of you men, especially you young boys, you better quit looking at porn or you're going to get a bad idea of what pretty is. I'm going to preach this. I don't care. You're going you're gonna to start looking at that and you're going to see somebody walk up to you and you're going to say that's beautiful because you've developed an unrighteous affection and you're going to miss the girl over here in the altar that don't have her thong sticking out of her blue jeans who loves her God and, and holiness becomes her and listen and so, so, so the girl you think is hot that's really nasty is going to be sleeping with the lawn boy when you're out of town on a business trip. But if you'd have seen how hot the holy girl was, if you'd seen how hot the holy girl was, then when your kids get a fever in the middle of the night, she can pick them up and walk the floor and pray in the Holy Ghost until the fever leaves.
And girls, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm coming, ladies. I'm coming, all the single ladies. I'm fixing to help you tonight in Jesus' name. You want to know what he drives? And you want to know what he wears? And he got him a little hipster haircut? And you think he's got game? But let me tell you, girl, if he'll play you, he'll play your friend, and he'll play your sister, and you better make up your mind, I want a burning man, not a player. I'm going to have to do it. I didn't mean to do it, but I'm going to have to do it. We're going unequally yoked in here. Come, come here, Zion. Come here. You and me, baby. Come on. That's what the Bible says. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers, which means, you know, y'all both got to be church of God, apparently. That's just stupid. It means you both got to be white. That's even stupider than you both got to be church of God. I like pushing on this stuff. In Tennessee, we ain't racist. We'll find out. Let your daughter bring a brother home for Thanksgiving, and we'll find out what's really in your heart, Papa. You redneck. You tractor pull watching inbred, two teeth having redneck. You better get over it, Jack. I'm telling you, you gonna get. If you think you're gonna hate people over pigment and celebrate God in heaven, you have bumped your head. Matter of fact, just to make the devil mad, come here, Deethra. We got to find this girl a husband. It's a matter of intercession at our house. Come on. What do you want to give for it? Forty four have had 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 So this is what this what we think it means to be equally yoked. Isn't she lovely? So Equally yoked means we have things in common. That's what we think. You like sports and I like sports. You're an athlete and I'm an athlete. You know. You like steel magnolias and I pretend to like steel magnolias because I know you like steel magnolias. Your favorite food is pizza and your favorite color is blue and we have so much in common. That's not what it means to be equally yoked. The yoke is a picture of oxen who are not connected because of color, size, commonality. They are connected together because they move at the same pace. Forgive me right now. God, get her, give her a right spirit right now. Creating her a clean heart. Go, God, renewing her right spirit. Let her not cast me away from her presence, Lord. So, so the only way you can ever know you are equally yoked is for you to run as fast as you possibly can. And when you hit top speed, you look over and see who was able to keep up with you. Marry them. Come on, run after God with all your heart and look at who could keep up and marry them. Because at the end of the day, this ain't about watching the movies. This is about his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Ahab develops an unrighteous affection because of his own personal perversions. It wasn't Jezebel's fault. It was Ahab's fault for ever being attracted to Jezebel. We know how je wicked Jezebel is. This chick is so wicked that she lives after she dies. My God, she's in Kings and she shows up again in Revelation and God's still rebuking people for tolerating her. Not even running with her, just tolerating her. There's a man named Heel of a city called Bethel that is under the government of Ahab and Jezebel who rebuilds the city of Jericho even though Joshua 6, 26 Joshua says, curse be the man that rebuilds Jericho for when he lays the foundation of the city he'll bury his youngest son and he'll bury his oldest son when he sets up the gate of the city what kind of man would build something that he knew would cost the lives of the next generation? a man who is under the government of sin listen fathers who think that your game playing is not affecting your kids we believe in the power of a blessing that if you're full of God and you're in love with God and you lay hands on your kids and bless them, a blessing will come. Why don't you think when you stick your hands up your secretary's shirt and stick your hands on your kids, you're not invoking a curse? I'm a, I, can t I better leave and leave town tonight. 
Come on, this is the mindset. I believe we keep worship music playing on a, in our house. Now, I'm not trying to be super spiritual, but y'all probably do too. On a loop, 24 hours a day, there's worship music playing in our house. And we believe it affects an atmosphere that affects our children, that makes them desire the deeper things of God. Is that okay? Then why don't you believe at 1 o'clock in the morning, if you're watching a girly movie on your computer in your recliner, that you also are not releasing an atmosphere that is releasing a spirit that is going to affect your kids in a negative way. We need some some men of God who understand that it is our responsibility to live upright and holy because we are setting an atmosphere that will determine the future of the next generation. Watch this. God raises up Ehud to break the cycle of ongoing disobedience. Ehud his name means he that praises in undivided union. He that praises in undivided union. The cure for the perversion of a culture and the sin cycles in a believer is a generation with an indivisible union with God. Praise is not, listen, praise is just noise without covenant. God established a principle in the scripture called fornication. Which means intimacy is not permitted outside of covenant. In essence saying that you can't be intimate with each other unless you're in covenant. It's a violation of the law of God regardless of what the culture does. Amen? Then what makes us think God's going to let us be intimate with Him without covenant? If you can't touch each other when you're not living holy and still be right with God, what makes you think you can approach God in His blazing holiness anytime you want to and then go home and live your own life? Listen. If I showed up to my wife and said, I'd like to spend an hour and a half a week with you, I'll meet you on Sunday at 10 o'clock. We ain't going to talk on Monday. We're not going to talk on Tuesday. If I'm in a real good flow and nothing's going on better at work, I may meet you for a few minutes on Wednesday night. No talk on Thursday, no intention on Friday, nothing going on on Saturday. And then Sunday, you got an hour and a half to blow my mind. I'm, a, I'm not, I'm, I don't know what I've gotten off into here. I'm... Listen, you can call yourself a bride and still behave like a whore. You, you showing up at an altar and throwing $20 at God and asking him to fill you up. We're behaving much more like a whore than we are like a bride. Wow, that wasn't very nice. Why can't we all get along? This is the principle. The principle is that God is going to release deliverers that are releasing the sound of heaven out of an indivisible union. You cannot expect God to use you if you're still determining how committed you want to be. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to understand eschatology and the consummation of the age and the four spiritual laws. And you don't have to be an expert at doctrine. And you don't have to decide if you're omnimillennial, premillennial, postmillennial, pre-trib, post-trib. Nobody knows anyway. Don't let anybody get on TV and figure out that tell, tell you they know when he's coming. No man knows the day or the hour. So quit trying to come up with a theory, fall in love with him, and win as many people to him as you possibly can. That's end time theology. <laughs> you don't have to know all that. You just have to determine that at no point in time am I ever going to divide this union. If this is not a part-time deal for me, this is not a season of seeking that I'm in before I go back to normal. This is not my response to revival. This is my response to the king and his glory. And I will never, ever, ever, ever go back to normal again. I got to move on. 
what is authentic and unique about Ehud. And why I believe Ehud represents the deliverers of the next generation is that he is left-handed. Why is that important for the Bible to mention that he's left-handed? Because he's from the tribe of Benjamin. Does anybody know what the name Benjamin means? Son of my right hand. Have you ever felt like you were the left-handed member of a right-handed tribe? Okay, just me. Come on, have you ever felt like you're the person in your church that wants more of God and you live most of your life ticked off at all of the people who are content to sit on their row and get out by noon? Like, like you're the one person in your church that gets up and dances and lifts your hands to God and cries out. Is it, am I, I, I guess I've been there. I, I, when I first started preaching, because so much of my slant was theological, I found myself in a lot of nominal churches. They'd bring me in to teach on theology, and I would stand up in the church, and they'd be singing out of a red back hymnal on page 67. And I got my hands up in there, and I'm crying, and I'm going after God. And I learned to get delivered from the opinions of people in a culture where God was teaching me that if I can do that at home and not do it in front of people that don't believe it, then I'm a hypocrite. I'm a poser. I'm an imposter. That my passion is illegal if my passion is not on display in any circumstance. Have you ever felt like you're a left-handed person living in a right-handed tribe? glory of God moves you're at the restaurant we had this happen today we're bawling and squalling speaking in tongues out loud waving our arms at the big river grill in downtown Chattanooga hallelujah ever felt like you were left-handed everybody else was right-handed ever felt like you're the one who wanted everything that God had to offer and everybody else around you seems perfectly content just to leave well enough alone ever found out that you can't enter into the same conversations that other people can enter in? you ever get to the point where you realize I'm not really interested in who wins survivor and which person the bachelor picks I I'm sick of hanging out with preachers because all they want to talk about is golf Seriously, golf. Like, can you see Paul saying, Peter, I just got off this boat. I'm going to come in your kitchen right now. You're, wel you're welcome. Just tell me I'm welcome because I'm coming anyway. And saying, listen, Peter, I know that we got a church, several churches to oversee. And I just got bit by this snake, but I shook him off into the fire. It wasn't that big a deal. Got beat with the 40 lashes minus one and went into prison. But I'm a three handicap now. You know, you know I'm, listen, I'm not, the, the purpose of this is not to be anti-golf. The purpose of this is to help the people who are left-handed, living in a right-handed tribe, that religion will always try to get you to conform to the nature of your environment so as you will not ever rock the boat. Ehud was left-handed, but he was from a tribe that was named for being right-handed. God is raising up sons that are left-handed out of right-handed tribes. That's a revelation. And the necessity of authenticity is just beginning to be realized as America is now finally admitting the depths of her captivity. And you, Ehud, with your left-handed slant are going to birth a deliverance of biblical proportion. The left-handers are coming. They're not going to do it the way you've always seen it done. They're not going. They're not going. They're not going. Sing loud and then sit down and get out at noon. They're going to tarry. They're going to wail. They're going to travail. They're going to cry out for God. They're not going to be satisfied with normal. They're not going to let you walk by them without telling you what God has been doing in their life. They're not going to shut up because it makes religious people uncomfortable. They're not going to go get back in their cage. They're left-handed. They're different. You've never seen anybody like them before. They're left-handed. They're left-handed, and they call prayer meetings at their house instead of adults playing video games. Seriously. 
We is for people who can't play sports outside. Seriously, I see families sitting at restaurants, six of them, no conversation because they all got their face in a phone. Maybe if somebody start talking about the things of God, we'd start seeing the things of God. Maybe if a left-handed person would initiate a dialogue, maybe if a person would say, you know what, that's not funny, and I don't want to hear that again, then all of a sudden, my God, we'd start to see a move of the Spirit that would come from somebody being left-handed enough that they did not care that they don't fit in with all the right-handed people that are doing nothing but walking around bragging about the fact that they're from Benjamin. You may be from the tribe of Benjamin, but you're still in captivity and God's about to raise up a left-handed generation. It might not look like you and they might not talk like you and when they dance in the spirit it may not be the Jewish kick like we're the Rockettes. There's a, kid, there's a group coming. There's a generation coming. Oh. Religion will always try to make you be right-handed because it makes other people feel better about being right-handed. The right-handed people are in captivity and the right-handed people are not healing anybody and the right-handed people are not delivering anybody and we are trying to fit in with a group of people that we are called to confront and God is looking for left-handed people. John the Baptist, in order to become the preparation agent for the King of Almighty God, to be manifested in the earth. The lamb was going to come. John knew to be a preparation agent, he had to get delivered from the system of his father. <coughs> John's father is Zechariah, who was a priest that served in the temple. So by nature of inheritance, John's lot in life should have been that he was a priest serving in the temple. But he knew following his father's pattern would not make a nation ready for Jesus. So he has to step out of his father's pattern and go into the wilderness and take off the ephod and put on the camel's hair because it was going to take a left-handed man to break people out of right-handed thinking. See, they thought he was coming to sit on the throne of his father David and release them from the oppressive rule of Rome, but rather he was coming to set people that were addicted free and to cleanse lepers and to raise the dead and to heal the sick. There is a left-handed expression coming. And it's going to identify to you whether you're religious or not. It's not going to look like what you've seen before. Well, brother, we think we know what revival is. I don't need anybody who claims to be an expert on revival that hasn't had revival. Revival is not academic. It's experiential. And our problem is we got churches full of people that have been affected and nobody's been infected. So we have presence meetings where God comes and we get affected and we appreciate a Christian concert and we call it a move of God. But I'm telling you, if you leave going, wow, that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck and you have no interest in helping anybody, it didn't go deep enough. God's raising up a left-handed generation. Religion will always try to get you to be right-handed because everybody else is right-handed. That's why we have to have true fathers because true fathers give authorization for authenticity. True fathers give authorization for authenticity. Listen to this. My God, they're fixing to go somewhere. Ehud's strength was the element of surprise. That Eglon wasn't expecting an attack to come from the left hand when he was a representative of a right-handed tribe. It's, it's just like God to send revival to the inner city. Because we're left-handed. See, we're coming left-handed. It'd be, it'd, be, it'd be just like God to get a people to come together on Friday night and Saturday night and Sunday night instead of Sunday morning and Wednesday night. Because there's something effective about coming at an angle in which the enemy is not used to being approached. All right, I'm going to give you some help on this and then I'm going to shift, okay? Ehud, Ehud had an unorthodox strength. He was strong where his enemy did not expect it. There's a term in boxing for a left-hander, a southpaw. 
I believe God showed me today that there's a Paul coming out of the south. That the Paul of the lion of the tribe of Judah is looking for an authentic end time expression of a group of people who are not going to stop because they're tired and they're not going to stop because they're uncomfortable and they're not going to stop because it's 10 o'clock at night. They're going to continue to roar until God releases a paw out of the south that ultimately causes the lion to roar across the nation. Come here, Mike. Come here, Mike. I know you don't like doing this, but come here. This is, this is my, one of my spiritual sons. He looks exactly like me. He's a Michael Red. He's an NBA all-star. He won an Olympic gold medal with the Dream Team. He played for 11 years with the Milwaukee Bucks and then went on to play for the Phoenix Suns, and I taught him everything he knows. And so, so he's left-handed, and he has a shot that is virtually indefensible because his delivery is unorthodox. So typically, because the NBA is filled with right-handed players, people learn to play defense in such a way that they are defending the shot being released from the right. Not only is his shot released from the left, his shot is released from a lot further back than most people's shots are released, and people always tried to change that. Because that doesn't look right. Yeah, but it, it worked pretty good. Uh, when you drop 63 points on the Utah Jazz in one game, I would not mess with your shot. He's more three-pointers in the history of the Olympics than any other player that's ever played in an Olympic game. And so you've got all of the success that came, and you've always got people trying to tell you, yeah, but that's not the way it's done. See, you don't need a shooting coach who can't do it telling you how it should be done. Charles Spurgeon said, those who think it, they know how it should be done should never interrupt those who are doing it. So there was a left-handed expression. A pitcher in baseball can go further with lesser talent because he has the authenticity of a delivery that other players are not accustomed to. So you may have a more talented right-handed pitcher, but because there are plenty of right-handers, you don't have anybody who can pitch left-handed. So you're, you're, you've always got a culture trying to tell you, that's not the way you do it. We are defensible because we are less than authentic. I believe the enemy sends reinforcements to the earth on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time in America and can pretty much chill the rest of the week. Then all of a sudden, people start throwing their pills away. All of a sudden, we had two people living homosexual lifestyles come into this meeting and get delivered, and one of them has decided to go on the mission field. We had a man come in here who was scheduled for a liver transplant, went to Vanderbilt to get the pre-op, and they said, sir, we misdiagnosed you. There's absolutely nothing wrong with your liver. Come on, God raise up a left-handed generation that are strong where the enemy does not expect it. Ehud had to make a dagger. He had to make a dagger. Why? Because the only thing his tribe could equip him with was something familiar. We only got right-handed daggers. So Ehud had to fashion his own dagger. Tra 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 travel. Oh, good Lord, God's good. I don't know if I want to do this or not. I do, I do. We got time? Thank you, thank you. Gary wants to stay if nobody else does. First Samuel 13. I'll try, to, I'll try to just read part of this. We won't be here all night. Verse 16. 1 Samuel 13, verse 16. says, Saul, Jonathan, his son, and the people present with them remained in Gibeah of Benjamin. Say Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped at Michmosh. 
The raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines and three companies. One company turned on the road to Ophrah, to the land of Shual. Another company turned to the road of beth And another company turned to the road of the border that overlooks the valley of Zebeoim toward the wilderness. Now there were no blacksmiths to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears. But all of the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare, his mattock. Place and keeps the fire big enough to create weapons to equip an army. Our problem is everybody wants to be a star and nobody wants to be a blacksmith. Everybody wants to be a preacher, nobody wants to be an intercessor. Everybody wants to prophesy in a pulpit, nobody wants to win souls on a soccer field. I'm going to talk about it. But the left-handers are coming. And the left-handers are more interested in victory than notoriety. So Ehud said, show me where the fire is, and I'm going to get that thing hot enough that it can bend steel, and I'll make my own weapon. God is raising up blacksmith leaders that are okay with having 50 people. Because 50 people with swords beats 5,000 people clapping. God's going to raise up these secret prayer meetings where the left-handers get together and nobody knows their name. And six ladies are going to get together in a circle and they're going to pray until the dimension of heaven begins to be released in the earth and authority hits an entire generation. And some preacher will get credit for it because he'll be the one behind the pulpit. But God Almighty will know that it was those little ladies in that circle that built that hot fire and put the weapons in the hand of another generation. I'm getting ready to close. Ehud made a dagger for himself. God's raising up blacksmith deliverers. If you feel called to do something great for God, before you ever find a platform, build a fire. I know pastors who have intercessors because they refuse to personally be men of prayer. I think every pastor should have intercessors. But I think those intercessors should be coming in agreement with the private declaration of devotion coming out of the burning man of God. You, 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 don't, you don't need to find a leader that's a great preacher. You need to find a leader that's a man of prayer. That was one of the things that was absolutely not negotiable before I jumped in this thing with this family. I knew immediately they were people of prayer. I knew because I would go up to the Udawa campus and walk in there and I find him in there praying and she walks in there and starts praying and he's drunk in the spirit walking up and down the hallways every day if nobody else is. And all of a sudden I begin to realize that there were a people who were living in the hot place, who were tending the fire, who were raising their kids around the things of God. And I'm telling you, if you're looking for a place to get connected, you better find a place where somebody has more than a good word. You better find a place where somebody has a personal flame that is irresistible when they step out of the place of performance. I'm going to hurry. I'm going to hurry. Put it on his right thigh. Left-handed man should have put the dagger on the left thigh. Why would you, as a left-hander, put the dagger on your right thigh and force yourself to have to cross over before you made an offensive move? 
word. Come on, there's mysteries in the gospel. Come on, this Bible is full of mysteries. I had this thought today. You ready for a random thought? And we'll get back to the left hand, right thigh. You ready for a random thought? Why did Jesus preach parables to people that he did not want them to understand them? Seriously, just don't preach to them. You said, I have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent. Then why are you telling the wise and the prudent the parables that you're not going to let them understand? I said, God, why would you say something to a people that you hid from them? He said, I didn't hide it from them. I hid it for them. I was protecting them from discerning something with casual approach. When God calls himself a mystery, it does not mean that he doesn't want you to find him. It means he protects you by shrouding himself in his own holiness so that you cannot find him with a casual approach because it is dangerous to you to be able to find him without appropriate pursuit. See, Uzzah, if it's not a big deal to you, Uzzah reaches up, touches the ark, falls over dead. Because he grew up in the house of Abinadab that had hosted the ark for 20 years and he got used to something he should have been afraid of. The reason we can't get to the glory of God is because we can't see the restoration of the fear of the Lord because nobody wants to preach a God that's worth fearing because they don't think it'll draw a crowd. The problem is who would want to serve a God that did not have enough awesomeness that you should be fearful of him when you approach him? So we don't have any more of the fear of the Lord. Nobody talks anymore about them. We talk about the moving of the Holy Spirit being people falling out in the floor. The problem is God said the Holy Spirit had a message. And it was to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. So we don't have the full activity of the Holy Spirit until people are being convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. You hear a lot of preaching about judgment coming in church? Of course not, because we're trying to draw crowds, not clouds. And until we get our mind off getting people and get our mind back on receiving glory, we are never going to be able to release the dimension that confronts the realm of darkness that causes a city to bow its knee to the king. And we are not after stimulating church people. We are after transformation of lost cities to the glory of Almighty God. Put it on his right thigh. Left-handed, daggers on his right thigh. He forces himself to cross over. He chooses to do it inconveniently. Because Ehud had a revelation that as unorthodox as he was, his strength still had to come from the same place as his father's. The problem with the left-handed generation is that they are in danger of casting off the voice of the fathers because they think they're too cool for them. And cool is killing us, and casual is killing us, and preachers that spend more time tying their tie and shining their shoes than they do preparing their hearts are causing us to have empty pulpits full of pews with people with empty heads that have no flame of fire on the inside of them. Why the right thigh? Because the right thigh was the place of covenant. When God got ready to make a covenant, he'd have a man put his hand under his right thigh and they'd swear to each other as a consequence of that covenant. So what was God saying? Why did he put his dagger on his right thigh? Because as unorthodox as he was, as out of the box as he was, as unique as he was, he still had to come from holiness. We, we, some, for, we some, for some reason, think if we're hip enough, we don't have to be holy anymore. And nobody is going to kill this obese spirit of perversion that we have been feeding in this nation unless they learn to carry their authenticity from a place called holiness. For some reason, we are scared of holiness. I had this conversation with somebody recently. You musicians, get ready. I'm going to leave these people alone. I had this conversation with somebody recently. They said, what do you think about this grace message? I said, first of all, don't call it grace. Because if you're going to do that, you're going to have to use a biblical interpretation, not a cultural one. If you want to use cultural interpretation, use cultural language. But if you start pulling words out of the Bible, they better match what the word means in the Bible. 
And grace does not mean God winking at dysfunction. Grace means God giving you an empowerment to get you out of a situation, not loving you so much he ignores it. Real grace doesn't leave you alone. Real grace walks into the middle of the hell you're in and pulls you out of it until you talk about who you used to be and you sound schizo. (laughs) I said somebody looked at the American church and thought that our problem was legalism. Really? That's what we're dealing with? Somebody looked at the American church and thought, you know what the problem with the American church is? Not enough grace. Seriously? A friend of mine told me that the American church needed the false grace message like a fat kid needs a Twinkie. I did not say that. Joel Stockstill, I'm going to call his name. Y'all can go get on his Twitter feed right now. This is, this is the concept. We, we weren't really afraid of legalism. We were looking for a license to sin. Let's get, let's, get right, let's get right down here where it is. You, you, di- you didn't, listen, you weren't afraid of legalism. You wanted to be able to get drunk. So you became a social sipper, which really just meant that you were giving yourself over to a lifestyle. <coughs> Hear me. We're just looking for a license. Come on, we just look, what can we do to get a license? We're looking to somehow, listen, when you get in revival, things you used to try to get away with, you're not interested in getting away with those things anymore. When you get in real revival, things I used to wonder how close I could get to the line, I'm not interested in seeing how close I can get to the line. I am interested in seeing how close I can get to heaven and still be walking on this earth. I'm looking for an Enoch moment where God just starts taking people up into heaven. So we don't use the F word. We just pay to go to a movie where they do. Well, brother, that sounds like legalism. Okay, then, then stay where, the, where there's no healing. Because there is no dagger unless it's coming from the place of holiness. The fat perversion is not going to die as long as the leaders keep rolling around in bed with the fat perversion. God is going to raise up people that are authentic, but they realize that me having tattoos means nothing if I don't have holiness. My God, I don't care if you got on a three-piece suit and a tie and a church of God comb over and you rolled up in here in a Lincoln Town car. If you want to operate in holiness, God will give you an authentic expression of the kingdom of God and we'll see demons begin to flee, not because your clothes are cool, but because your heart's on fire. All of the Old Testament is Christocentric. Ehud is pointing to Jesus. Left-handed. Born in a manger. Left-handed. Rumors going all over town about your mama all your life because she's trying to sell people on the idea God made her pregnant. For real, Mary. You you know, you and Joseph, y'all had never, y'all never did it. Y'all know what it is. Y'all never did it. God made, okay. You're a virgin, but you're going to have, okay. Now you're pregnant and you're a virgin and y'all are married and y'all still hadn't done it. Joseph was a bad man, I'm going to tell you. That brother better be one of the 24 elders or I'm going to be offended. Huh? That ain't right. What? 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 Left-handed. Kings born in barns. Left-handed. Healing evangelists coming out of the projects with no daddy. Left-handed. Come on, somebody. Prophets who were crackheads. Left-handed. 
Come on. A woman who went through a divorce because she had a sorry husband that beat her and God uses her to proclaim the truth of the gospel because God's going to raise up the left-handed people. God's going to raise up people, my God, who came from the wrong side of the tracks. God's going to raise up people that have been through hell. God's going to raise up people that have a burning flame of revival in their soul and they don't care what anybody else thinks about them. God, raise up a left-handed Come on, Ehud, put it over here. Makes more sense. Put it over here. It'll be easier. Put it over here. It'll be more convenient. And Ehud said, no, I'm going to put it over here. Because when I have to go through the inconvenience, I'm going to remind myself that it is not because I'm cool and it's not because I'm different and it's not because I'm out of the box. It's because I am holy because of covenant relationship with Almighty God. God's doing something right now we have never seen happen before in the earth. And millions of people are going to be affected by it and I'm praying a few of those get infected by it. I'm praying that a few of the people get so wrecked that they walk into grocery stores and people begin to confess their sin out loud. I'm praying that a few get so wrecked that they walk onto the oncology ward at the hospital and they start laying hands on people until hair starts growing back between their fingers. I'm praying that a few people get so wrecked, oh, hallelujah, that when they walk onto their college campus, people start weeping and laying in the floor and saying, I've got to get right with God. History is not made because people are cool and relevant and out of the box. History is made because people learn to become who they are and they operate through a gate called holiness. <clears throat> Nothing frustrates me more about my peers than the heresy that says you being relevant is more valuable than you being righteous. I believe there are two twin whores the church got in bed with, relevance and excellence. We decide if we put on a good enough show, we can win the world. No, you might get people to leave one church and come to your church, but you won't win a soul. I believe in excellence. Listen, nothing aggravates me worse than people who don't take care of things and do things right. But the idea that that excellence is going to be what wins people, it may be what attracts people, but it's going to take holiness to win them. Yes. I'm asking God, I'm asking God to visit us with another holiness revival. I'm asking God to visit us with a revival that I know it's, I know some of y'all don't want to hear it because you're trying to see what you can get away with. But some of us are turning our cable off. Right now, literally, right now, people turning their cable off. People that are realizing maybe they don't need nine televisions in their house. Maybe their kids don't need to have an iPad and an iPhone to walk around with and stare at all the time. And they're being mused to death while a culture goes to hell and the church is playing games for an hour and a half a week. God's about to raise up left-handed people. And listen, if you think it's got to come through the right-handers, the left-handers about to get on your nerves because they're going to get all over your purse. People are going to start coughing up demons. This idea that we don't have demons anymore, we have issues. We counsel things that we should cast out. You know, why we don't want to you know why we don't want to deal with demons? Because the demons are a reminder to us that we have sold short in the arena of holiness. And we are not 
qualified to confront the realm of darkness if the same spirit is operating in the leaders. Mighty God in Jesus' name. So what God's doing is he's raising up a remnant of holiness-driven leaders. And the style is not going to be what's relevant about the coming generation of leadership. It's going to be the fire that you cannot ignore. I prophesy the coming of America's hottest flame to sit in her pulpits, to sit behind her keyboards, and to walk in grocery stores, and walk into malls, and walk into dormitories with an irresistible flame of a fresh fire of holiness I tried to spend a season of my life seeing what I could get away with and still be right with God and I decided I'd rather see the blind healed than get to cuss a little get to go back and listen to that music again well, brother, that sounds like legalism. You know what? This is what's interesting. A person in holiness and a person in legalism basically live the same lifestyle from a completely different motivation. Let me say that again. The person in legalism and the person in holiness basically live the same lifestyle from a completely different motivation. Legalist lives the lifestyle in fear of judgment. The holiness person lives the lifestyle in fear the dove will leave. Start tickling something up there, Marlon. These people are about to ambush me. <laughs> God, I don't want a revival if it's not going to birth holiness. If, 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 if more people are going to get slain in the spirit and the same amount of people are going to get divorced, I'm not interested. If we got buildings full of people and we're going into building programs and, 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 and the kids still getting a cigarette put out on their forehead down the road, I'm not interested. I want a holiness movement to come. John tells a story that Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell. But John tells it a little differently. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell the story of Jesus being baptized by John in the River Jordan. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all say that when Jesus is baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, that the dove descends upon him. John is the only gospel writer that says when the dove descends, the dove remains. Matthew doesn't say it. Mark doesn't say it. Luke doesn't say it. But John says when the dove descends, the dove remains. Thankful for my friend Bill Johnson for this revelation. The dove descends and remains. So Bill says, how would you live your life if there was a dove on your shoulder and you never wanted it to fly away? You'd live taking every step with the dove in mind. Why, 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 are, you, why are you talking about all this holiness stuff? Because I want the dove to stay. I'm starting to ask myself before I watch it, is that what the dove wants to see? I'm starting to ask myself before I listen to it, is that what the dove wants to see? I grew up thinking if I listened to it, I'd go to hell. That's legalism. This isn't about heaven or hell. This is about making sure we kill this fat perversion by being willing to inconvenience ourselves by taking our left-handed dagger out of our right thigh. Whew, there it is. There's a wave of holiness coming tonight. Come on, this, you can't hear this kind of message and repentance not come to you. If you've been playing games with the things of the world, if you've been tolerating a lifestyle that you never would have been interested in when you first met Jesus, then I'm here to tell you, God is not up there trying to help you get away with more things. He's trying to give you an inheritance of signs, wonders, and miracles, but it's not going to come until somebody quits asking for permission to color outside of the lines. I told this story last night. I was preaching at a big event with Michael Red at Ohio State, where Ohio State plays basketball in this arena. What, six or 8,000 people there at this event, I guess. And, and uh, Michael and some of his NBA buddies had set up a panel, and they were having a slam dunk contest to try to get kids interested in what God was doing in this meeting. And so uh, they let them all come try to dunk, and they couldn't dunk, and so they lowered the goal. They lowered the goal. 
and a kid wins the dunk contest and struts around like he is Michael Jordan. It's exactly what the church does. We lower the standard and then celebrate the fact that we made the shot. The standard is still the standard. And the glorious thing about meeting the standard is when you begin to meet the standard, you begin to inherit the power that is a consequence of that standard. Power is coming back. But repentance is coming first. Let me say that again. Power is being returned as an inheritance to a people that are returning to God. It is bad theology to say God took miracles away. God, you may live in a world of seasons. God does not. We sing songs that are unauthorized. It's a new season. It's a new day. It's an unauthorized song. Jesus demanded that a fig tree produce figs when it wasn't the season to produce figs because he said, at my word, you are no longer subject to seasons. This idea that we burn for God sometimes and don't burn God for God other times, sometimes we're interested in God and sometimes we're not, depends on whether we're on the mountain or in the valley, is terrible theology. We have to make a commitment that regardless of what's going on around us, we preserve the fire within us. You guard that fire at any cost. You guard what God's doing in you at any cost. And you make a decision and a declaration that you are going to the best of your ability surrender to the lifestyle that God has enlisted as a standard. And listen, you're going to mess up sometimes right here along with me. And you're not going to hit the mark all of the time. But because you can't hit the mark does not mean you're going to lower the standard. It means you're going to accept a greater grace today than you had yesterday to be able to please God more in this moment than you've ever pleased Him before. In the name of Jesus, holiness is coming. Holiness is coming, power is coming, and repentance is going to be the thing that leads the way. If you have allowed yourself, if you listen to me, hear me tonight. If you have allowed yourself if you've allowed yourself to walk into things that you have been convinced have provided freedom for you and tonight you'd be willing to admit there's no freedom in them at all. And God's going to begin to call us back. Many of you have heard me share this story and I'm getting ready to close. Many of you have heard me share this story but coming into this year I was in a store I was buying my dad a pair of boots for Christmas and I'd been praying and fasting and asking God about what he was going to do this year. God spoke to me in that store The man spoke to me from the store, actually. I asked the man before I bought the boots for my father. I said, my dad's not here to try these on. What's your return policy? God began to speak to me so clearly that I know the man's mouth was moving, but I have no idea what he was saying. God spoke to me, and he said, I have one of those. I said, well, you have one of what? He said, I have a return policy. And he said, if you will return to me, there are things that must be returned to you. But you've got to draw nigh to me before I draw nigh to you. You are the instigator. You are the initiator. And you've got to make a decision that you are not happy with things as they are. It's illegal to use kingdom lingo and not have dominion. Let me say it again. It's illegal to use kingdom lingo. It's illegal to call yourself an apostle and not be birthing apostolic fruit. The enemy will be glad to give you the terminology if he can keep you from the function. We don't need apostolic principles. We need apostolic demonstration. We don't need kingdom teaching. We need dominion authority. I don't know how to do this any other way tonight than to ask you if in any area, no matter how large or how small, you have tried to see how much you can get away with and still be right with God, then I can tell you I know what that feels like and I know what it is for God to get you in a revival where he drives that junk out of you. I'm glad we had went ahead and had the altar call about heaven and hell because that's not at all what this one's about. 
This one's about a people who are going to be qualified to kill Eglon of Moab that is sitting in a fat seat of perversion because they've been willing to live a lifestyle that says, yes, I'm authentic, and yes, I'm unique, and yes, I'm different, but what is primary about me is that I have set myself to walk holy before God. Every step with the dove in mind. Every step with the dove in mind. I want you guys to dim these lights, please. I know it messes up the feed for live stream. I don't really care tonight. Thank you, all of you watching on live stream. I didn't mean I don't care about you. I mean I don't care that it's about, yeah, I guess I don't, whatever. 